Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, questions involving a plan to expand broadband internet in schools. We'll hear about efforts to restock bass in Roosevelt Lake. And we'll learn about an event that focuses on optimal aging. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The governor's office is proposing a plan to expand internet broadband infrastructure for schools at a cost of $350 million. But the plan is facing opposition from school officials. Joining us now is Chuck Essex, Director of Governmental Relations for the Arizona Association of School Business Officials. Good to see you again. Thanks for Thank joining us. Thank you for having me, Ted. Broadband infrastructure across Arizona. This is a very important stuff, and we've got a ways to go to catch up to other states on this, don't uh, we? We certainly do. And we, we've had many years where we haven't done as much as other states. It's, but it, it impacts our schools, it impacts our libraries, it impacts our hospitals, it impacts all our individuals. And the importance, again, to education, because that's your focus. Uh, talk to us about that. It, it connects education and students to the world. Uh, part of it, what's being focused on, is the testing program, because the new testing program to the state will be an online testing program. But that's only for a small portion of the year. The main thing with the Internet, not only in Arizona, but in all the other states, they're using it for students to access information globally, to be connected, and to do courses online. It just has such great influence on a student's education. And so if we are lagging 15 to 20 years behind and here's a plan now to spend $350 million to get back up to speed, what's the problem? There's absolutely no problem with the plan. I've not talked to a school person who, has, who isn't excited to see this coming to Arizona, and, but so should everybody else in the state because it would really move our state into the super highway, information highway mode. What, con school, what concerns schools is how it's being funded. They object to the fact that they're being singled out and having to pay a portion of the cost themselves where no, n other portions of the state that will benefit from it really aren't being assessed the cost. It's something great for the state to do and something good for the state to fund. And this is $15 per student uh, for six years, something along those so, lines? Uh -huh. Yes, that's correct. It's like a, so $15 million maybe a year for six years? $990 million. So the total cost is $350 million. Schools, it sounds like that's about a quarter of the total cost, correct? That's correct. Okay, and then the general fund would be a quarter of, a, of the cost, and then a private firm pays what? Uh, they say the private uh, companies will pay about half of the cost because they'll benefit from it because they'll be able, they will own the system and be able to market the service. So a quarter of the cost, do you think that still is too much for That's, schools to pay? Uh, Definitely. When you look at, first thing I just went on the internet today, broadband creates jobs, broadband a catalyst for small business growth. It'll have, be such an economic boom to Arizona, but it's also, I don't know how you assess who benefits the most. Libraries are going to benefit, schools are going to benefit, hospitals are going to benefit, doctors are going to benefit, people's businesses are going to benefit, so why just single out schools? This is something the state ought to take responsibility for. And you, people have heard this before, schools have been hit pretty hard over the last five years with budget cuts and it's just one more thing that they don't need to pay for. I, I know that there's an argument that schools could pay for this through the inflation adjustment adjusted funds. Your thoughts on that? The inflation adjustment funding is to do just that, so schools don't lose ground to inflation, which they've lost uh, ground over the last five years. So you're right, you could use that to pay for just about anything, but then it defeats the purpose. The inflation funding is so schools can keep pace with inflation so they don't have to cut programs. The idea of the schools, again, a quarter of the total cost. Um, the fees would then go to the state. You could then leverage that money to get federal money. You leverage the federal money to get more private development in here. Uh, the schools are a part of the community, in many cases the focus of a community. A lot of lawmakers I'm hearing saying, uh, why not? Um, well, well, when you look at the schools in most communities, they're the center of the community. When the, the, the in information gets to the school, it's going to be available to everybody in the community. So why doesn't the state make that, when they built, I was quoted in the paper, when they, when they built the highway to Flagstaff, they didn't charge Camp Verde because Camp Verde was going to benefit from that. And that's the same way we shouldn't charge schools. The second thing with schools, a lot of schools have done a lot of the work already and they're going to be charged fifteen dollars per student where some district that hasn't done anything so there's a fairness issue involved but also if there's anything the state should do this is it okay so 
if that's not the best idea as far as funding, what is a good idea? A really good idea is the internet tax that is most likely going to be in place in most states. That right now, the, a lot of the internet sales are not taxed unless the company has a presence in their own state with a warehouse or something like that. The federal government is pretty close to changing that. Um, and once they do, Arizona is estimated to get a hundred to seven hundred million dollars in additional revenue each year. What a better place to use some of that money early on to get this project completed. And once it's done, then they can go use the money for other purposes. But what a great way, because the reason that, that people can shop on the internet is because they have access to the internet. And expanding internet will expand that concept. And yet there's already talk of maybe cutting Arizona income taxes uh, correspondingly to what those internet taxes might be in order to keep Arizona consumers from facing a tax hike. Well, I don't think it's a tax hike because if you would have purchased a television in Arizona at a store, you would have paid the sales tax. You purchase it online, you don't pay the sales tax. It's just an equity issue and other, other um, purchases are covered. Should, uh, with a, again, a quarter of the funding coming from schools and, and school officials saying that's too much, it, what, what isn't too much? An eighth, a sixteenth, what? what? I, I think people ought to look at it differently. They ought to look at this benefits everyone in the state. So rather than trying to figure out who benefits by how, what percentage, this is something that the state should take on and get it in place. And then the districts and homeowners and everybody else can pay the annual fees to use it. But I don't know how you determine who benefits by how much. And, and indeed, last question here, Senator Don Shooter, who's uh, very much behind this, has said it's good for the community, hospitals, government agencies, they can all tap in along with the schools. It's all good. Everyone's contributing. You're just saying too he, much on the backs of the kids? Well, he proved, he proved my point. Uh, of that group you just listed, the only one that's being assessed a fee is schools. Everybody else is going to benefit and they're not being assessed the $15 per student or anything similar to, to what schools are. So he's basically proved the point that this is something good for a wide variety of people. Why not have the state take that responsibility on? A general fund a quarter of the, the amount paid as well in this particular plan. More, you think, should come from the state? Or maybe the private sector can make a greater contribution. We also have, if you notice, President, the President has proposed $750 million, I think, of new money from businesses. The E-rate, they're doubling the E-rates. There's going to be a lot of money coming from the federal government and from businesses to help on this, so maybe that'll cover a good portion of the cost. Last question, where, where, where do you see this headed? Are people talking about this? Or there's a lot of discussion, and, and, and I just want to re repeat that schools are very much in favor of this. It's just the method that they chose to fund it that schools don't think is fair. All right. Chuck, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining I'm us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Arizona Game and Fish Department is spending $356,000 to increase the bass population at Roosevelt Lake by introducing a fast-growing Florida species of bass. Here to explain is Curtis Gill, Fisheries Program Manager at Arizona Game and Fish. It's good to have you here. This is fascinating. I had no idea that this kind of a problem existed out here. Uh, why is this increase again needed bass at Roosevelt Lake? Well, in, uh, over recent years, we've noted a pretty big decline in our fish populations at Roosevelt Lake. We've noted about a 75% decline in our electrofishing catch rates for largemouth bass and about an 8% decline in our bluegill electrofishing catch rates. 
Uh, same with our black crappie out there. Our gill net catch rates have declined by about 80%. And we've also seen a decline in the condition of those fish. And why is that? What's going on? Out there? Uh, there could be a number of factors contributing to that. We've had uh, gizzard shad showed up for the first time in Roosevelt Lake in 2007. That's an illegally introduced species. Um, they can compete with uh, sport fish in the larval stage and can also, um, they outgrow uh, the gape size of many of the sport fish so quickly that they're, then they're unavailable as forage. We've also had largemouth bass virus uh, show up in the Roosevelt Lake. It was first detected in 2011. Although we haven't seen declines in our fish populations from largemouth bass virus yet, it has been shown to, to cause declines in other states. Uh, we have decreasing water levels at Roosevelt Lake. It's been um, on the decline for the past three or four years during the spring. It's a time when the fish are spawning, so that can dry out their spawning sites mm -hmm. and you can have really poor reproductive year classes. Uh, additionally, we've also seen golden algae show up. We had major fish kills at our other Salt River chain lakes, Saguaro Canyon and Apache Lakes, back in the mid-2000s as a result of golden algae, basically eliminating the smallmouth populations at Apache Lake. And so we saw, noted our first fish kills at Roosevelt in 2012. So we have a number of things that kind of collided all at once out of Roosevelt Lake that have attributed to these uh, declines in our fish populations. And, and that's a big, well, Roosevelt, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, it was once considered a huge bass location, like one of the best in the country, wasn't it? Yeah, it was noted as one of the best in the country, and it's uh, our second highest in angler use in the state. Okay, you mentioned all these things. I want to go through them uh, a little finer tune here in a second here, but what about, and I've read about this, in other lakes and other parts of the country, cormorants are mm -hmm. being blamed for lots of fish dying off and fish levels slowing. Cormorants a problem at Lake Ro at Roosevelt Lake? Not at Roosevelt Lake. We do have issues at some of our urban lakes like Tempe Town Lake and some other smaller urban lakes, but uh, large lake like, like Roosevelt, we just don't have the population of cormorants out there that we're seeing any so impacts So not, not from that big a concern? Not at Roosevelt, no. You mentioned gizzard shad. Now gizzard yes. shad, this is, this is a, a, a fish, mm -hmm. invasive. Yes. And no. it's pushing out the smaller shad, is that the idea? Correct. Threadfin shad is our, our forage base that we had prior to the uh, gizzard shad sh showing up. Threadfin shad grow to only about maybe six or seven inches maximum length, uh, whereas gizzard shad can grow up to, to 16 to 18 inches, and they can grow to eight inches within their first year of life. So they quickly outgrow the, uh, the size that most fish can eat them, most sport fish can eat them. Even the large mouth bath, not, not, uh, not as large a mouth needed, huh? Right, and that's, that's one of the things maybe the Florida strain can help out with. They, they grow faster and, and larger than than the, the northern strain that we have in there, so that it's a possibility that they may be able to eat some of these gizzard shed. Well, talk about this Florida species. They're, they're mm -hmm. faster producing, bigger. What are these, like super bass? What, what's going on here? <laughs> no, they're just a, a, a strain of largemouth bass that uh, typically do well in warmer climates. Uh, like, they're, you know, in Florida especially, they, they're known for their fast growth and then the, the size that they can attain. And so Arizona, we have very similar conditions to some of these other states that have shown a lot of success with Florida strain largemouth bass, like Texas and uh, Oklahoma have had really good success um, growing larger bass with are, the, using the Florida strain. Are they as easy or are they more difficult to catch? Um, that kind of depends. There's been sh studies that shown they are a little bit more difficult to catch. Um, there's also some, some studies that say they're basically the same. So. Um, it's right. kind of it's kind of mixed on the research that you read on that. But. When they're more difficult to catch, what does that mean? They're just a little smarter than the average bass. I mean, what's a uh... <laughs> smarter? <I don't... laughs> just wary of lures yeah. and these sorts of things. Yeah. Um, are they more expensive than our Arizona homegrown bass? They're fairly expensive, and I don't know if that they're more expensive, but the bass in general are just, you know, they're. Um, Right now, I think the going rate on largemouth bass is about twenty dollars per pound, mm. so almost twenty dollars a pound. So wow. they're, they're fairly expensive. The, uh, you mentioned the falling lake levels mm -hmm. um, and, and not as many nutrients and not as many hiding places. Talk to us about this and, and the, the idea of maybe some artificial reefs out there. For uh, what the, the uh, Arizona bass kind of like to hide in spring a little bit, huh? Is that the idea? Yeah, many of our reservoirs in Arizona they're typically fairly devoid of any kind of aquatic habitat. Roosevelt Lake, when it's full, does actually have a lot of submerged trees, uh, things like that to provide habitat, but it's been down in elevation now for three or four years, and so it's only about, I think, 48% full right now, so when it's at that elevation, you know, these reservoirs were formed in steep canyon, uh, mm -hmm. a river bed, basically, and so there's not a lot of habitat there, so one way we're hoping to 
help counteract the, uh, the declines we've seen is it creates some habitat, gives uh, spaces for you know, young fish to avoid predation from, from other fish and, and grow. And but I, I did read, and tell me if I'm wrong here again now, that the, the, the largemouth bass here in Arizona, they like to hide and attack and, and use some of these hiding places, as opposed to this Florida species, which is so big, they say, here I am, I'm gonna come get you, and that's about it. <laughs> well, in all honesty, I'm not okay. <laughs> wasn't familiar with that difference. <laughs> all right, well, I was just, maybe I read a little bit too much into the, uh, the difference between those. The impact on local businesses, hotels, marinas. I mean, we can talk all we want about sports fishermen and what they're going through, and it's a concern, and there's a, but there's a business aspect to this too, isn't there? There is, and we've actually been meeting with uh, some of the local communities up there in that Roosevelt area, Tano Basin. We've had hosted three public meetings to date, and we'll be hosting another one in March just to, to get their feedback on their perceived uh, concerns and what the, the issues they think that, and how we can address those issues and, and try to help them out because they, you know, a voice to us, they have seen some pretty significant financial impacts from, from the fishing decline out there. You mentioned that this was kind of a perfect storm. Is that storm continuing? Are conditions changing? Is it a kind of a moving goalpost kind of a thing? Or, Well, the, the one thing we did note with our most recent surveys with the decline in all the other fish species that we saw, we did see a decline for the first time in our gizzard shad population since they've shown up. Um, whether that's going to be a long-term trend, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but as far as other factors like the golden algae, um, unless we get some precipitation the latter part of this winter, there's a, a really good chance that we can have uh, golden algae fish kill there again this summer because it's triggered by higher conductivity levels. Uh, so when we don't have the runoff in the Salt River system, mm -hmm. those conductivity levels rise and we can see fish kills related to golden algae. So, Just uh, last question, you're just out, of, <clears throat> just out of my curiosity here. How do you know how many fish are in the lake. How do you do sampling? So how, how does that work? Uh, we do sampling with a boat, an electrofishing boat, and with gill nets. So electrofishing boat is our primary tool that we use for uh, sampling largemouth bass. That's the most effective way to, to do that. And basically it's just, uh, we have booms off the front of our boat that uh, put a positive charge in the water and the fish are drawn to that. They come up, um, they, they're stunned momentarily, we net them and then we can weigh them and measure them count them and get good uh, information on the, the species status basically. Well all right so when are we going to start seeing these Florida bass uh, flopping around? This out spring. There? We're this hoping spring. to have yeah, get some fish stock this spring, get the remainder into our hatchery and, and then stock again in the fall with, with Florida strain largemouth bass and crappie and bluegill. All right well good stuff. Uh, we hope it works. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Climb east along US 60, approximately 55 miles from Phoenix, and you'll come to a marker for Picket Post Mountain. Early Mexican residents called it Tordillo Mountain after small birds in the area. In 1870, the soldiers of Indian fighter General George Stoneman renamed it Picket Post Mountain for the sentinels they posted here high above infantry camp established at its base. Within eight years, a town of 2,000 called Picket Post, later Pinal City, sprang up to work the Silver King Mine, Arizona's richest silver strike before it petered out. Today, thousands flock to the foothills of Picket Post Mountain to stroll through Boyce Thompson Arboretum, home to more than 6,000 plant species and 270 kinds of birds. ASU's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute is holding a forum on aging this Saturday at the ASU Nursing Building in downtown Phoenix. The event is titled Abundant Aging and Longevity and will feature speakers presenting the latest research on a variety of age-related issues. Here now is Richard Knopf, director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. It is Osher, correct? That's correct. All right, because I want to make sure I get it right because <laughs> it's going to be around for a while. It's a lifelong learning yes. uh, institute. <laughs> Uh, the focus here is optimal aging. Define Correct. optimal aging. I would love to. I'd like to start with the notion that, did you know at the turn of the century, the lifespan was 47 years? My goodness. And we're up to 87 years now. So what is happening is we have a preponderance of older adults with a lot of gifts, uh, a lot of ways to contribute to society. 
And historically, many people have looked at older adults as frail. So the whole idea is to flip that whole paradigm around and start looking at uh, older adults with abundance and ways to contribute to society. And the event is titled Abundant Aging and Longevity. That's what you're talking about, but it, it exactly. sounds to me like you're talking about folks who aren't necessarily aging. It's the other folks looking at the aging folks and saying, you're not so frail anymore. That's right. And the reason this all came about is we started looking at the medical side of the house and to have an event that will look at breaking medical news. And the more we poked around ASU, we found out that's just a piece of the equation. There's things called community formation. There's caregiving elements. There's a lot of scientists doing a lot of work on how to create optimal aging processes, only some of which is related to medicine. Indeed, and I noticed that you had speakers talking about Alzheimer's and, yes. and memory issues and healthier brains, the study of bees and mice on healthier it's brains. Amazing. That, yes. that sounds fascinating. It is fascinating. Yes. And, and, and other issues like if you have a chronic illness and you're older, I mean, you could be spending quite a few years managing that particular illness. Yes, yes. And that's where the social environment comes in. Uh, what scientists, we've done a lot of research on abundant aging, and if you think of a four cylinders in an engine, there's four things that have to work well. One is being physically fit and physically alive. The second is cognition and being cognitively alive. We've always heard the old saw, I work crossword puzzles because it's good for my brain, but it's actually a little bit deeper than that. Uh, neuropsychologists have talked about flexible cognition, where different neural nets start working together. And that's different than rote learning. Yes. So the whole idea of the Osher Institute is to expose people to cause and effect and the reasons why things work, not just how and what to do. That's the second thing. And the third thing is actually the sense of community. There's some very sobering statistics uh, put out by the AARP. And what they've shown is in the last 10 years, Older adults' uh, feeling of loneliness has skyrocketed. Some 15% more older adults feel lonely. The flip side, those who are doing research on that phenomena find that people that are involved in community, involved with their family and friends, are interested in um, on passing things along to the next generation, their rates of depression go way down. Uh, the fourth element I almost forgot is the feeling of self-efficacy, a feeling that you are important, that you have a way to contribute. This all ties together in that medicine is only one piece of the equation about abundant living. And I noticed that another speaker is going to talk about the literary and cultural ways to make every moment count. Exactly. Interesting. I mean, so basically you're talking about the arts and the impact on aging. The arts and also he'll be sharing through history of literature how people have approached older adults um, sort of uh, looking at the end of life and he's going to tie it into some meditative principles of how do you reframe the whole direction of your life so you have a more abundant life. What about the issue of, of boomers balancing and maybe optimizing caregiving yes. and their own taking care of themselves. I mean, yes. that's an, you talked about turn of the century, that's a new phenomenon too, isn't it's it? It's huge, uh, sandwiched, we often hear that word. And Dr. Kuhn will be speaking about that very issue of how to actually balance your own lives as you do the caregiving for your uh, family. Mm -hmm. Is this an evolving issue? Is this something that we're learning something new all the time? It sounds like it is because, as yes. you mentioned, it's something that hasn't necessarily been around all the time. Yes, and that's the phenomenal uh, part of ASU in which I'm very proud is uh, the revelations are just incomprehensible uh, happening every month. Uh, so yes, we're proud of that. Before we let you go, the Osher Lifelong Learning yes. Institute. Give us a brief synopsis. What are we talking about? A here? brief synopsis is part of Michael Crow's vision for an age-friendly university. That is to open the doors of the university to all components of society. We offer short courses, uh, 35 bucks a pop, uh, about 150 to 160 courses a year. It's literally simulating the ASU experience. You can come in and have a short course, no test, uh, four sessions on sociology, or on neuropsychology, or on robots and the planets, on and on and on. It's to bring older adults 
access to ASU intellectual, cultural, and social experiences. All right, Abundant Aging and Longevity. This is 9 a.m. to noon on the 15th at the Nursing College, correct? Exactly. All right. See, I almost remembered that one myself. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> good. Good to have you here. Thank you very much. And tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, Senate President Andy Biggs and House Speaker Andy Tobin will be here for their monthly discussion of issues at the Capitol. Legislative leadership Tuesday evening, 5.30 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. A reminder, if you want to see what we're working on uh, for future shows, I want to see maybe a past show, information on what we're doing here at Arizona Horizon, check us out, azpbs.org slash horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.